Well, thank you very much for those warm words, and Mary, thank you for your introduction. I'm going to speak about Kapraszynski and development, but I hope that won't stop you when we get to the question and answer at the end, talk, allowing us to sort of talk about the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. I sort of wanted to talk about them uh, in the lecture, but decided that old Kapuscinski up there would be sneering down at the idea that development could be reduced to a series of goals. So I didn't quite have the, the courage to do it at any length in the speech itself, but forced me to afterwards, if, if, if you will. Um, Mary, thank you. It's, it's always great to be back here. And, you know, one day, I hope I'm going to impress enough professors that someone else introduces me. <laughs> but I, I tell Mary it's really because we're a fan club of two. So um, <laughs> and one day we'll come to one of these lectures and it'll just be you and me, the students <laughs> who have all gone. Not quite yet. I, I've, I've always, I have to say, personally been, been fascinated by uh, Kapraszynski. He, he showed his readers in Africa or Iran um, which he lifted free of the statistics or uh, official public relations its re leaders uh, revealed and showed instead their uh, cant and hypocrisy as well as, in journalistically brilliant terms, their little van vanities. Uh, but it was, it was his view the unvarnished one of the clear-sighted journalist or was it as much a commentary on his own Poland? Um, whatever it was, it was helped by a dose of inventiveness that went uh, beyond the bounds of journalism and which uh, he's been criticized for uh, in, in latter years. He exposed an Africa to his readers in which he punctured, as I said, the pretensions and follies of rulers and officials while showing an intense emotional identification with the continent's then underdogs, its people. So in this lecture, I'll ask whether uh, Ricek, as he was known to friends, would see the current state of Africa as a further triumph of the elites he exquisitely skewered, or the redemptive emergence of a new and part more participatory and juster continent. I think in many ways he'd be pleased by the Africa he saw today. Some of the, his most vivid lines describe the poor around the world, and particularly in that continent. Um, and of course, although poverty remains, um, even as he died in 2007, Africa was already starting its upward growth trajectory, pulling up incomes across the continent. In 2012, reports by the World Bank, the IMF, the uh, private investment banks, and a little publication who just 12 years ago named Africa the hopeless continent, The Economist, have reported on and prophesied now about the African dawn, and it's a sort of standing joke amongst those of us who are old economist journalists that you know, this is probably Africa's, cause, Africa's problems uh, to be now applauded by that magazine. <laughs> um, it's luck may turn, but you know, economic growth has averaged 6% over the last decade, greater than that enjoyed by India uh, over, say, the 1995 to 2005 period. The IMF predicts that 10 of the 20 countries with the highest projected compounded annual growth rates over the next five years will be from sub-Saharan Africa. Now, of course, much of this is actually down to, to natural resources uh, and their development, but nevertheless, the region is going to grow by you know, a remarkable amount, 5.3% uh, in this year alone. And you know, we've seen some striking adjustments to figures. Ghana's 2010 GDP revision uh, added $13 billion uh, to its GDP through um, an IMF-driven uh, recalculation. And it shows that, you know, actually, you know, there are still difficulties with a lot of African economic statistics. But I think what can't be denied is the general direction uh, is very much of upwards at the moment. Um, and, you know, trade figures, which are in many cases easier um, to, to, to measure... Um, show that exchange between Africa and the rest of the world tripled uh, over the last decade or so for which we have measurement. Uh, finally, much of the promise of the newly independent states that Kapuscinski visited is now finally being realized. One of the first countries he went to was Ghana, 
a country that has obviously seen extraordinary changes over just the last 10 years. His own trip came, first trip came at a time of boundless post-independence optimism. He describes at length his meetings with Kofi Bako in 1958, the first Minister of Education and Information in Nkrumah's government. Bako declares, only 30% of people of Ghana can read and write. We want to abolish illiteracy within 15 years. But only a few years after he'd expressed this sentiment, Ghana was thrown into turmoil and in the following period suffered coups and economic decline. Uh, one of the few beneficial side effects was that many Ghanaians went abroad, most notably my old boss, Kofi Annan. But between 2013 and 17, Ghana, a country of 23 million people, is expected to grow at 7.5% a year. And that education minister would be proud if he was still around to know that in 2010 the adult literacy rate was 67% and it's youth literacy rate even higher. It's a country that President Obama and others have, have described as a model uh, for the continent. And now many of the estimated 800,000 Ghanaians abroad are starting to go home and take part in this economic revival. It's one of the 23 African countries that have uh, reached the way these things are measured, sort of middle income status. A recent article in The Guardian told the story of Julian Apuni, who, returning after 20 years of working for Lloyd's in the UK to work for Fidelity Bank in Accra to help capitalize on the growth of small and medium-sized businesses. And, and of course, the phenomenon of, of, of exciting economic return and of the fall in global property is, 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 is you know, a wide one with the Millennium, the millennium Development Goals have, have, have followed, and it's not, as I say, peculiar to Africa alone. Extreme poverty, measured as under $1.25 a day, has fallen globally from 43% in 1990 to 22% in 2008, and is expected to fall to 14% in 2015, uh, according to the World Bank. And, you know, it is, you know, worth reflecting just for a moment that when the MDGs were first proposed, and you know, I was one of those who both wrote and helped propose them. They were widely thought to be much too ambitious and aspirational to be taken seriously, and there's still a very good sort of academic living to be made and journalistic living to be made uh, to in, in rubbishing uh, the progress that has been achieved. There are remain more than a handful of skeptics, but the halving poverty target was achieved five years early, uh, and not just because of progress in China. Um, the clean water target also met five years early. But in Africa, the trend is possibly the most surprising of all. A recent commentator contrasted the notably despondent analysis of Africa in 1997 of two of those skeptics, William Easterly and Ross Levine, who reported that the typical African mother had only a 30% chance of seeing her children survive until the age of five, uh, with the fact that Africa has recently witnessed now uh, falls in child mortality faster than those recorded anywhere else, now obviously uh, from a worse base. In the five years to 2010, Senegal has cut its under five mortality from 12.1% to 7.2%, and Rwanda and Kenya did almost as well. Yet, despite this progress, and I think if Kapuscinski was here, he would at this point raise his hand and insist that this good news be interrupted for a moment, uh, and that we be reminded that a core of the very poor remain, and increasingly they'll be found in an arc of weak and fragile states, pure Kapuscinski reporting territory, if ever the war were, because these are the poor that he as a war journalist would have been most familiar with. A report by Homi Karas, now the lead author of the post-2015 high-level panel meeting on the MDGs, which David Cameron is one of the co-chairs and which is meeting today in Monrovia, Liberia, together with uh, and Andrew Rogerson, a former colleague of mine from the World Bank. Together they predict that income stagnation and high fertility rates in fragile low-income countries 
uh, alongside um, the dy- when, when compared with what's happening in the big, uh, more stable countries uh, such as China, India, um, and the other dynamic middle-income countries mean that by 2025, out of the 560 million people living in absolute poverty, only 100 million will be in those stable middle-income countries like China. The vast majority will be in uh, poor, unstable countries, and the vast majority of those will be in Africa. Uh, Claire Melamed of the ODI makes the point that MDG gains have not been evenly distributed. Indeed, progress against MDG targets can often mask not just significant inequalities between countries, but within countries as well. Um, and you know, sometimes that progress is because of uh, success in just a couple of countries. I mentioned clean water. Well, that's largely because of progress in, in China and India, and indeed sub-Saharan Africa remains uh, off track. But you know, a, a bigger point that she makes is that you know, even within uh, countries which are doing well, uh, you see time after time that the bottom set of households get left progressively uh, further behind. In Brazil, 74% of households in the bottom 10% by income are of African descent. In Vietnam, only 7% of ethnic minority households have access to improved sanitation, uh, while for other groups it's dramatically higher. In Nigeria, the southwest region has childhood mortality rates of 32 per thousand life, life births, while the northwest region, which always perennially feels that it's you know, underserved by uh, what they view as Christian-led governments uh, out of Abuja, has 139 deaths per thousand live births. And, and so I can go on with similar uh, examples from Kenya and, and elsewhere. The UK Parliament's International Development Committee reports that the relative nature of the MDGs had this unintended consequence of exacerbating uh, inequality. And I, I know it very well because you know, I've seen in countries like Rwanda, not through any malice, but in the effort to sort of meet the goals, achieve the scorecard, you go after the easiest targets. The people who are on 90 cents a day to lift them above $1.25 a day. Those who are reachable from urban centers in terms of reaching them with additional health care. And you have this sort of last mile problem of, of, of groups uh, who are left behind. And I think it's one reason why in the next generation of MDGs, we have to introduce this concept of getting to zero, uh, getting to the last hardcore examples of, uh, of uh, cases of, of, of poverty uh, in nations and, and between nations. Um, and you know, I, I, th- I think the, the related thing about that is, is, is how far to pursue inequality. Again, something that Kapuscinski, reform-minded though he was, uh, the old Polish socialist still, uh, I, I think would have had interesting uh, views are. Kevin Watkins, who at, uh, just at the end of my time at UNDP became the editor of our, of our annual uh, Human Development Report, observes that in India, if you go back, 15 years, there were just two dollar billionaires in India. Now there are 46. Uh, The 176 billion total net worth of the billionaire community in the country has climbed from about 1% of GDP to 12%. He goes on to say that's enough to eliminate absolute poverty in India twice over, with enough left over to double spending on the country's shockingly underfinanced public health system. But, you know, when I went, and, and then he concludes by pointing out that, that Asia's Gini coefficient, the most widely used measure of inequality, as I don't have to tell an LSE audience, has increased from 39 to 46. But you know, when one then goes back and looks at the Gini coefficient in the United States, for example, one realizes that the periods of economic growth which have led to the sharpest reduction in poverty have more often than not also been accompanied by periods of extreme inequality as capital formation occurs and is subsequently used for reinvestment in uh, growth and jobs. So uh, I think Kapuscinski, like me, struggles with what is the fair and just way to 
to, 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 to look at the relationship between uh, inequality and poverty. Um, he certainly, though, would have been delighted by Watkins' comparison of the uh, Ambani's home uh, in India, which overlooks the Baikula uh, district of, of, of Mumbai, which has six million slum dwellers. So you have the richest house in the world uh, overlooking one of the biggest uh, slums. Uh, and so, inevitably, tackling this issue of income inequality is not going to go away. Uh, it's, I doubt, reducible to a goal in the MDGs, and indeed I can imagine parts of the MDG constituency who might be you know, very alienated uh, were it to be done. But it is impossible to imagine zero poverty in a world with the existing levels of inequality that we see growing up uh, today. And so Kapuscinski, just to take stock, might, you know, while sort of seeing this economic picture as mixed, uh, progress in terms of incomes and poverty reduction, but a little uncertain about the implications for uh, social order and political cohesion of this rising inequality, would also, I think, warn us that despite all the positive news about Africa, uh, the threats that he saw and reported on coups and conflict are not gone uh, from the continent. Recent events in Mali, the Central African Republic, the DRC in Sudan seem to confirm uh, a durable, sad stereotype of a continent prone to violence. But even that uh, has to be taken with a large pinch of salt. Uh, Scott Strauss, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, is only one who is pointing out that, in, that according to the Uppsala um, conflict data program that wars in the 2000s are substantially down from their peak in the early 90s uh, and you know if one counts an up, even if one counts an uptick he wrote during the past two years there are about one third fewer wars in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in this period compared to the early to mid 90s but nevertheless he concludes these recent wars signal clouds gathering and according to him, and I think Mary's own work would be along the same lines of saying, you know, today's wars are typically smaller. Uh, they often involve, as we've seen, small insurgencies of factionalized rebels on the peripheries of states. They also play out very differently. They exhibit cross-border dimensions, and rather than drawing funding from big external states, they depend on illicit trade, banditry, and other international terrorist networks, he, he says. Um, and adds, consider two violence over vital resources such as land, water, and pasture. Now, you know, I, I think all of this, when added with climate change, rapidly growing urbanization, and other changes that increase the pressure on vital but often scarce resources, lead this professor to conclude, and I, I don't disagree with him, that we can only expect to see uh, more violence. But on the other side of the ledger, Africa has increasingly democratic government. Uh, admittedly, only one, but to start, I mean, what, only one African state now, Eritrea, doesn't bother to hold elections of some kind. Uh, the Mo Ibrahim Index, a quantitative measure of good government, shows a decline of 5% in African political participation since 2007. And as countries have turned to multi-party elections, so too has the risk of violence during these electoral campaigns increased. And I'm sure one bellwether will be the forthcoming Kenyan elections in early March. But we've just seen the astonishing success of the Ghanaian elections, another close finish where both sides respected the outcome. But, you know, for every Ghana, there's an equatorial guinea where President Teodoro Obiang was elected, quote, unquote, with 95% of the vote, and his party won 99% of the seats in Parliament in a country where an estimated 75% of the population live on less than $700 a year, when if it was equally divided amongst them all, they'd have a per capita income of $35,000, because Equatorial Guinea, because of its resources, is the country, continent's richest country. Which brings us, of course, to what uh, Rizek would have, uh, I think, really had a lot to say about, which is that the scramble for African resources is so evidently on. Uh, 
only five of Africa's 54 countries are not either producing or looking for oil or gas. This resource wealth may fuel, I fear, further inequality and hence uh, also internal discord. Uh, it also may drive into state conflict as resource discoveries uh, lie on, often on the borders of territories whose ownership has never previously been disputed, uh, but which now suddenly is the source of, uh, of, of, of potential major dispute because of the oil lying underneath it. Um, and, you know, so I think, just for a moment, returning to Equatorial Guinea, which is the most galling example of the sort of extravagant elite uh, that this new wealth can furnish, uh, but it's not the only one. Um, although I do think that actually uh, Obiang would have been a more severe subject for uh, Kapuscinski's writing uh, than his famous book about the Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Um, I didn't um, I, I, I didn't know uh, Haile Selassie except, uh, as I say, through those pages, but I do know uh, Teodoro Obiang, and to borrow a phrase, he's no Haile Selassie. Uh, but his <laughs> failings have indeed attracted a literature uh, on corruption because it is uh, so extreme. Um, that, you know, and, and, and so these problems around imperfect democracy, uh, continuing levels of, 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 of potential conflict and indeed actual conflict uh, have, have led to some renewed pessimism in the uh, pages of uh, policy pa pa papers and elsewhere on Africa. Uh, Rick Rowden, a development consultant and advisor to UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, wrote recently in Foreign Policy magazine a myth of Africa's rise and criticized Africa's reliance on a limited range of commodities and extractive industries compared to the much more labor-intensive, manufacturing-oriented growth of Asia. Um, but, you know, he's been countered by others who've pointed out that, you know, lots of the great economic success stories of today, Brazil, Chile, uh, diamond-rich Botswana, you know, are all heavily dependent on commodity exports. There's uh, nothing to be ashamed of in that. It's how you use the resources uh, that are generated. And that successful stewardship of uh, the wealth that flows uh, from mineral and energy discovery has been picked up by David Cameron, who's argued that successful development needs to be underpinned by what he calls a golden thread of governance-related issues, which he hopes will be integrated into the post-2015 development agenda. And given his role as co-chair of the high-level panel, I no doubt he'll make a strong case for it. Um, and, and he's reflecting the argument of quite a few when he says, you only get real long-term development through aid. There's also a golden thread of stable government, lack of corruption, human rights, the rule of law, transparent information. But of course, even in asserting this, there's a risk of great offense to countries who think that they can work that out for themselves and don't need a British Prime Minister um, pushing it down their throat. Um, so the post-2015 development goals are very relevant as the high-level panel is meeting in Ron Monrovia and you know, we'll uh, then have a meeting in Indonesia with that under its third co-chair, President Yudhoyono, and then present its findings uh, to the UN Secretary General. But you know, for those delegates assembling to take stock of what's been achieved in the first set of MDGs and what's to come next, they might reflect on how Monrovia itself, Liberia's capital, is changed since Kapuscinski's visit at the beginning of its civil war. In a chapter in his book, The Shadow of the Sun, called The Cooling Hell, Kapuscinski describes driving through the streets of Monrovia in Liberia at the very beginning of the war. Quote, on both sides, sides jutted back, jutted forth the black, charred stumps of burned, demolished houses. Uh, he also goes on about a very large uh, black insect which consumed him. I think it was wandering around his hotel room. Uh, today, Liberia has Africa's first female president, although not now the only one. Uh, there's Joyce Bander in Malawi as well. Uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, relative peace, uh, relative security, 
and relatively free elections. Its GDP is forecast to rise uh, 7.4% over the next year. So as, they sit, as that, the eminent global panel sit down, they should be considering how they might try and do what Ellen, an old colleague from UNDP, uh, has sought to do uh, in Liberia, which is to facilitate an inclusive development um, which addresses not just poverty but inequality, uh, but in a thoughtful and balanced way that does not uh, turn off uh, the engines of growth. And, you know, I suspect they'll conclude that building that kind of world will come from spreading the benefits of education and the hard and soft infrastructure of roads, communications, accountable public institutions, and the rule of law. And, you know, most of all, perhaps, they'll come back again to one of the original objectives of the MDGs, investment in, in education. Uh, an investment bank report recently said, if we see education as the bedrock of society, then the remarkable aspect of education throughout Africa is the improvement of the last 20 years and the expected growth of the next 30. More often than not, the statistics that speakers give are related to primary education, which is a I mean, vital issue. Nevertheless, you know, as important, and perhaps for uh, our knowledge economy, even more important, secondary education has expanded dramatically from one pupil in 10 in 1975 to four out of 10 in a much larger population size by 2005. And by 2020, this particular investment bank estimates that um, between five and nine out of 10 uh, children of secondary school age will be in secondary school by 2020. When Kapuscinski first visited Africa, by contrast, the number of Africans reaching higher professions was shockingly small. Kenya didn't have its first African lawyer until 1956, a Luo who had to wash dishes in the UK to pay for his education. In northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, um, only 35 Africans had pursued higher education by 1959. And in Nyasaland, now Malawi, the figure was just 28. The secondary school enrollment rate across Africa in 1960 was just 3%. Shortly before Kapuscinski's death, sub-Saharan Africans' secondary school enrollment rates were equivalent to where Turkey or Mexico had got to by 1975. And while, like there, there are whole issues of quality that need to be addressed uh, behind these quantitative top numbers of enrollment, nevertheless, if we see what's happened since to Turkey, Mexico, or Indonesia, uh, I think we can hope for similar improvement. Uh, in the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, the consequences are a real knock-on in terms of the opportunities it creates for those countries within uh, the global economy. Um, so what would Rizek have made of all of this? As commentator, he could not fail to be impressed by the economic progress. As journalist, his foreign correspondent's heart would beat faster at the prospect of African, the Africans' conflicts still sadly left to cover. As social scientist and political economist, he would worry at the rising tide of inequality that has accompanied falling poverty. He would note the social strains of mineral and carbon fuel exploration, of urbanization, and of the commercialization of African farming. As a novelist, which, after all, in part he was, as uh, his, his, his biographer and others have subsequently pointed out, he'd be delighted to find that Africa still has its share of strong man leaders with their vanities and peccadilloes. In some, perhaps, he would conclude Africa is on a roll, but he might also conclude that it was not quite yet time to sheathe his pen. <laughs>